Base is dropped a little later than usual, but it's dropped. Soccer down here, March 4th. It's an overreaction Monday, and there's some reactions to talk about, that's for sure. Atlanta United losers yesterday in the nation's capital, 2-0 to D.C. United. It extends a, a couple of bad streaks. Uh, Atlanta United has not won a Major League Soccer season opener in their history yet, and they have not won or oh, even gotten a result. Well the season did. Yeah. Well, they haven't won or gotten a result in D.C. either, like ever. It's really weird and strange, and it was kind of a weird and strange day and night in D.C., uh, we thought there was going to be snow. That didn't happen. We thought there might be um, more chances on goal. That didn't happen either. Um, the field held up okay, but it got kind of sloshy by the end of it. And it was just a frustrating kind of night. I mean, I think that's a fair way to put it. Um, I've talked a oh, lot yeah, sure. about this. Do- Jarrett's <laughs> ordering food. What's up, Jarrett? <laughs> Jared's welcome back to the show is uh, ordering guacamole, I think. Or not. <laughs> Where am I and what's going on? I don't know either, Nick. Nick's here. John's here. Uh, Jared is maybe here? Maybe not. Nick, let's start with you since this is normally the soccer over there uh, segment of the day. What were your thoughts on Atlanta and D.C. last night? I think we all died, like all of us together. <laughs> oh, Jared's broken. Okay, we've got some technical difficulties because, you know, that's what we do around here. Um, give us just a minute because this is how this seems to go sometimes. We're going to take a quick break, get this sorted out because we are all disconnected and we're going to figure this out for you all. Hold on just a second. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented all right, by Apple. Somehow I figured this out. That was Personal stupid. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. <laughs> Supporters of Atlanta United. Yeah. No, no, no idea, idea what happened. Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today. At Steve oh, that's bizarre because we were talking before the show went live and then we go live and somehow it mutes the Skype call. The initial consultation is free. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy. Okay, so you can tell how much rest I've gotten in the last couple of days, and my computer's trying to make me go insane. Um, Play me me equipment. I am, because we were talking before the show started, and then all of a sudden it just muted you guys, like from me, not from the audience, who's now wondering what in the bluest of blue hells was that all about. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know either. I'm sorry. I apologize. First Monday of the regular it. season, brother. No, I apologize I, for nothing. I blame it on the uh, trying to watch a game through like three different panes of glass and plexiglass and spinning around to look at a monitor. And I think I got whiplash and or motion sickness calling the game last night. I don't know which, but uh, it was a Scooby Doo chase sequence. Yeah, it was something. Um, so I'm going to shut up because I'm going to break something else if I keep talking because that's been my run today. Nick, what were your thoughts uh, on the game yesterday? Uh, look, 
I'm seeing a lot of venom on social media. I don't think the game warrants necessarily all the venom. I can understand frustration. I'm right there with you. But as anyone uh, would understand that sometimes in these compressed situations, you have to field a squad that can be competitive. And, you know, they're not building rosters using chicken bones and Ouija boards. And so we got the best roster that the sports science department said is, you know, hey, these guys are ready to go. It was a sloppy game. It was an ugly game. And, you know, in those games, something goes sideways. You walk out with an L. Something goes sloppy in your favor. You walk out with a win. This didn't happen in our favor today, man. I mean, it's one of those situations. What are you going to do? It's a sloppy game, kind of like this show so far, eh? Well, yeah, but, you know, the difference is is that they have – Atlanta United has a team of people. You know, whenever you see the players rip off their jerseys and they have that little goofy vest bra looking thing on, they're tracking all the movements, how how much they sprint, the level of intensity of their sprints, and they they quantify all that data and they put it on a spreadsheet and they says, hey, this is how we get the optimal performance from the team by putting out these players. Theoretically, this should get us a win or as close to a win as possible in our situation. We have Skype, some uh, chewing gum, some WD-40, and a couple of jumper cables, and that's about it. Hey, hey I've got some duct tape, okay? You know, look, we get duct tape. You know, we do what we can do. But you know, look, let's, let's go ahead and just say what it is. People are going in on 343. They're going in on Frank. We've already seen a parody account saying that Frank needs to go, and I think that's hilarious and sad at the same time i just don't want us to descend into the uh the alabama fandom where you know it's the paul feinbaum show where people threaten to fire nick saban because he drops a game to auburn you know yeah it can't be both because because then you are totally the uh the feinbaum show and hey credit to to paul for making a career of it but it's either the Alabama dynasty of all sports and everybody must bow down or fire everybody and, and kill the program and start over. It's one or the other at all times. That's not a good way to live, I guess. I mean, there are times when the opponent is flat out better. And I thought last night DC was better. They get the goal before the half. And I mean, how many times Jarrett, do we talk about, in games where goals before the half change everything. And in this one, I kind of felt like that was the case. The first half felt completely even until they score on a set piece. Yeah, set piece they shouldn't have got either. I mean, yeah, that's the first another one. one. You got to tell me about that because I couldn't see it. Yeah, it you pretty clearly goes off a DC player. This. It, it pretty clearly goes off a DC player. They they run the corner in. It gets headed out. Next corner they score on because uh, Ariola doesn't give up. I forget who was on that near post who lost track of Ariola and let him get that free touch in. It, it, bottom line, it shouldn't have happened, but it did, and it resulted in a goal. Um, yeah, it, it felt like everything changed at that point. Then uh, Acosta does what he does to Atlanta. I mean, at this point, Lucho Acosta to Atlanta is, to me, my opinion, he is what. Tito Villalba is to Columbus. He's that guy you don't want to see. He's that guy who every time you play, you're like, ah, man, we played them and they scored. Who scored? Oh, it's that guy. Or that guy impacted the game. And that's where it is right now. As far as this team as a whole, they've played three games. Uh, The first game, you lost in Costa Rica, which is, I think Matt Doyle said, it's kind of a rite of passage for MLS national team, Mexican national team. Liga Mekis teams, everybody goes to Costa Rica and gets their block knocked around a bit. It's just a thing that happens. Then you beat a team at home uh, that you should have beaten and perform well. Then you lost on the road to a team where you've never really looked good in their stadium, whether the old raccoon-infested stadium or the new you know, concrete-falling-down stadium. So it's been three games where weird stuff has happened. You've had... Pretty much all three results, if you go by the hashtag MLS is hell argument, then all three results have kind of gone according to plan. You might not have liked the way they looked, and I completely understand that, though. Yeah, it was a weird one. The goal, you watch that set piece back, and, and it's played not quite to the back post. Luciano Acosta gets in and has the first touch in front of Michael Parkhurst, 
And it, I mean, it's a clever play because Paul Areola is making a looping run around, looking for the touch back to the near post. He's unmarked. He's wide open. Nobody picked him up. I mean, you could look at three different guys that maybe should have run with him. Um, but it's a well-designed play, and they score. That's been a problem, John, in Atlanta United's history is set pieces, and it happens again. I think this is a lot like 2017 where you had Tata Martino implementing a style, a philosophy from day one. You were focused on that. You didn't spend a lot of time on set pieces. It showed. It got better in 2018. I think Frank DeBoer is focusing right now on the run of play and maybe a little less on set pieces, and these things are going to happen a little bit early in a season. And in that second goal, it was hit with the outside of the right foot, and it did take that screwball skip and work its way to further away from Brad Gazan's left and ends up in the back of the net. So, I mean, for me, if you really want to quantify or qualify how the game was, for me, it was sloggy and cloggy. And sloggy because of how the turf was, especially in that last 20 or 30 minutes, as rooster tails seemed to be the, the way of the day if, if there was anything going on on the ground. And to D.C. United's credit, clogging up the midfield, making sure that uh, P.T. Martinez was not going to be able to do what we know he is capable of doing, what Joseph is capable of doing. And then it was having to work stuff on the edges with Breck Shea and Mikey Ambrose working a place that he's never worked before. So it's it that was just how it was. And for everybody to sit here and say that the sky is falling, it's not. Kansas City trotted out pretty much a starting 11, starting 11 going up against LAFC and was there until the absolute death. So for Atlanta United to put out that lineup to continue to get acquainted with each other and continue to get acquainted with the system didn't necessarily surprise me as much, although probably the number might have a little bit. But, you know, as close to a first choice lineup, I think with what, two subs away from the Arediano match. So. There were, you know, so I understand the idea of trotting that lineup out there to continue to get acquainted with each other in the system and working little societies. So uh, you, you tip your hat to D.C., a corner kick that shouldn't have happened, and a, a screwball that, that skips off the turf. It's 2 nothing. Okay, you move on. It's a short week. Uh, the staff meteorologist, Mike Conti, golden ticket. He's already on his way to, to Monterey, I believe, if he's not already there. And teams already on their way there. If they're not already there, you're on your way there tomorrow. And that's just the next step. So here's the next step in, in the work rate. And it's in CONCACAF Champions League. And it's coming at you fast. Yeah, look, I, I don't want to make it feel like you can't be frustrated with what's going on right now. No, I mean, feel the way you feel. I just want people to understand a little bit of the bigger picture here because – you look at these three games, and, and you pull the numbers, and you start to look. So possession, you had 53% at Aridiano. You had 61 in the second leg. You had 56 at D.C. Um, you've had over 50% of the possession in every half you've played so far this year. Pretty good, implementing a new style and kind of getting accustomed to it. Your passing percentage, the worst half you had was the first half in Aridiano. After that, you've been over 80% and you've been over 83% in every half you've played. Uh, 85% for the game in the second leg, 85% for the game at DC. I know a lot of people are like, oh, there's so many passes that are bad. I think in the, in the game yesterday, it felt that way because of the passes in the final third. You really didn't see a lot of chances created. And that's the biggest difference between the three games. You look at key passes. It's a stat that Opta tracks. It's passes that would be assists if a goal is scored. There were 11 of them in the first leg at Aridiano. A lot of those coming in the second half. There were 14 in the second leg in Kennesaw, which resulted in eight shots on goal. Yesterday, it was only five and two shots on goal. Nick, I mean, this is something that, that we talk about with possession teams, and you see it all over the world. All that possession is well and good but you have to create chances coming out of it. And if there's anything to, to be concerned with when it comes to Atlanta United right now, you created three chances in the first game of the year in Aridiano. You created two chances yesterday. You create or yet eight shots on goal in the Aridiano game at Kennesaw. 
you're not getting enough of a final product so far for all the possession. No, you're not. But that's going to take time and it's going to come. And I know that that some people hear this and hear apologist, 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 shill, whatever you want to say. But it takes time for these players to get on the same page. And, you know, we saw on the preseason, uh, you know, a lot of connectivity that I think was probably a little more advanced than it should have been. And the problem with that is that it's streaky. Sometimes it's going to be there and it's going to look like a million dollars and sometimes it's not. And that's one thing that we talked about with when, you know, when Atlanta brought Frank DeBoer in is that there's going to be moments in this transition where it's going to look amazing. And then there's going to be moments where you're going to be like, what in God's name are we doing? And I think last night is one of those what in God's name are we doing moments. And I promise those are going to go fewer and farther between as we go along. But, you know, you have a, sw- a changed up lineup, so chemistry is already affected with that. You have, a, you know, certainly elements of exhaustion that factors into it as well. You have conditions that factor into that as well. So when you start stacking all this stuff up and players, you know, having to play together, that product will come. That 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 offense will click, and when it does, it's going to be something special. You know, with, when when Tata Martino and you know, had the team, we were firing away, but it seemed in second halves, we had a lot of lapses. Well, we sorted that out, right? That, that happened. And it's not just limited to one side of the game that, that, you know, fixing the the defense under Tata Martino, fixing the offense under Frank, it's going to come, but it will require a little bit of patience and a little bit of trust. And I think that, that for me, if, if you're getting these same types of results in like May and June, sure. At that point, start going nuts. But for right now, third game of the season, chemistry will come. We know, we know Joseph. He's a, he's a known quantity here. If you watched any of Copa Libertadores, you know P.T. Martinez. He is a known, known product and a known quantity. It, it's going to work. Barco, I think, could probably take a few more shots here and there. He does a little bit of dancing with the stars sometimes. Uh, you know, a little too much for my taste. But... He finds passes. He makes things work when he's in the game and he's functioning. Outside of that, I think it's going to be all right. Yeah, that's a key that you mentioned about Barco because because what you said is a criticism a lot of people have. But he's led the team in key passes in every match this season. You know, he's had he's had more key passes than anybody in the team so far. That's an important aspect of what's going on. You have to have more of those. I agree. I want him to, to play even more loosely than he has and I think at home in Kennesaw he looked good he looked really good and he looked like he was playing with a lot of freedom playing with a lot of confidence the the games on the road not as much but more than we saw last year I mean he had three key passes on the road in Costa Rica last night he had two of the five that the team had in general there, there just has to be a little bit more. I mean, I think that's where you're at right now. As you know, Nick said, it's going to come and go. You're going to see ups and downs. You're going to see bad performances. I would be willing to say that you really haven't seen a bad performance outside of the first half in Costa Rica. And you ended that one 2-1. You got the goal late from Gressel to make it 2-1. Bad? I, I would like to know what the definition of bad soccer is if you're looking at last night. Because... DC really didn't do a whole lot more than the two goals they scored. And as John said, one's a set piece. It's a well-worked set piece, but it's a set piece. The other is a screwball shot that takes a weird hop off a wet turf, and Brad doesn't handle it well. You've had weird goals given up this year, Jarrett, and you know, you're know you not giving up a ton to the opposition. I thought again last night, Miles Robinson was was maybe the best player on the field for Atlanta United. I thought he was excellent again defensively. Yeah, he's looking like that guy who was taken second overall in the draft, and it looks justifiable. Um, took some time, but uh, he's starting to really look like that guy. It's It's been weird. First three games have been weird. Um, again, I, I, I keep kind of in my head going back to like, man, all this does for me is continue the fact that Atlanta United just gets weird when they go to D.C. Um, like last year, that team was cooking. They went to D.C. and ran into all of the problems. Uh, and I, I guess in the back of my head as well, I kept thinking, like, this is not great. I want it more from the final third. 
at the same time, they could drop like a four one on DC at home because why not? That seems to be uh, that seems to be in the realm of possibility. Uh, it it's just going to be kind of weird, I think, while you're trying to get your legs under you. If you want to compare it to 2017 and say, okay, well, it took time to get things in, in, in gear, and then you know you were you were able to get things in gear in the second game with. Minnesota. Well, first of all, it was snowing, and second of all, that Minnesota game. <laughs> DC doesn't have a Vadim Demidov, like no. they don't. Who basically was like, "There you go." I mean, you do what I you can. Vadim with. Demidov. She's just screaming "Ole" as she nutmegs me repeatedly. <laughs> like I'm just getting nutmegged by my child repeatedly as she screams "Ole." That sounds about right, Jake. That's, yeah, and that's. That is uh, how we summed up the 90 minutes last night. It was just, it was weird. Um, and I wrote about it today, and if you saw the post in a bit, in a weekly article we're going to run on STH, that as much as you want to, for me, as much as you want to go at Atlanta, I give DC credit. DC looked like a team that isn't going to come out of lane eight this year. They look like a team that's going to be there throughout the season in terms of just overall talent. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, I think D.C. is a contender in the East, and I think they showed that last night. Here's one thing that is a little concerning to keep an eye on as as time moves on this season. Aerodiano in the first leg and in the game in D.C., their central midfielders outplayed Atlanta central midfielders. And I I know people are going to say, well, Darlington Nagby was great yesterday and Eric Ometti was great. Yeah, I thought both were good. But Russell Knauss and Junior Moreno bottled up the middle of the field. The outside backs for D.C. kept Breck Shea and Mikey Ambrose in check. And it took P.T. Martinez coming in late and flaring out wide and creating 2v1s and mismatches to really start to open things up in the final third. John, this is going to be a recurring thing with two central midfielders for Atlanta United in the 3-4-3. How... Do you think this changes? Do you think you see, like we did in the home leg against Aridiano, uh, Barco dropping deeper and helping them out a little bit more, or other changes to deal with teams that maybe the two central midfielders just sit deeper and clog things up, as we saw early in 2017? There are a lot of comparisons to 2017, the more I think about it. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm just gonna like step in here and Go you know, just you know, talk about my love for Russell Knauss for a minute because I really enjoy Russell Knauss. <laughs> I hate that he plays for DC and you have to play against him and he kind of has that rivalry feel. And Russell Knauss can play, and it was disappointing with the midfield how much it got clogged up. And um, you know, Breck Shea wasn't the same Breck Shea you saw against Arediano, and no. I think you could have no. predicted that it wasn't going to be perfect. But you would have liked to see a bit more. But um, at the end of that game, Jason, I know you talked about you, – you brought on guys at the end of that game to go for it, to give it a shot, to, to end on a high note. I am excited about what Pity Martinez can do when he's playing 90 minutes during the season of this team. Yeah. Yeah, here's one thing that, that was very noticeable going back through some of the numbers from last night. When P.T. Martinez came on, really – you know, Eric Rometty was maybe the focal point of the possession up until that point, and then it was obviously P.T. Martinez. They tried very hard to play through him and give him an opportunity to flip this game on its head, and he put forth an effort. It just wasn't always there. You know, he had a couple misconnections with Joseph. These things happen. Think back to, and I'm already seeing the comparisons about P.T. Martinez and Miguel Almiron. One, they're completely different players. Two, John, remember how long it took Miguel? He had the Minnesota game, yes, and then everybody expected that every week. It really wasn't for it was from there until the Houston game with, yeah. with Joseph injured that the attacking side of Miguel Almarone kind of popped up again, and it was inconsistent early on in his career here. And just remember, and to your point, to, to the question you had before we had our Canals aside, uh, I do think that you're, you're going to see Barco coming back or whoever is in that that cradle drifting back to help out things in the middle. But I, I don't know. I guess the subtitle after the colon for this particular show should be Things Take Time. And I, and I know that because of 
schedule truncation and schedule importance and, and everything else going on, I know that a lot of folks are, it's like, well, we don't have time. And that's true. So you're, you're dealing with a double aspect here of, of what you're seeing. You're seeing a team trying to work through tweaks in a system, personnel changes, and have to do it through hemispheric competitions and now the beginning of your domestic league. So, uh, yeah, things are coming at you fast, and I think that probably you're going to be spending a lot more time looking at things through video than you would be on the pitch just because of everything going on around you right now. And, yes, it took a while for Miguel to get squared away. It's going to take a little while for PT to get squared away. And we saw flashes, but we also saw the hiccups. And not everything is going to be 100%, 100% of the time. But when it does, it's going to look very pretty. And it's going to be tremendous for this team, both offensively and defensively. So I I know that we're preaching patience here in the first 26 minutes of the show. And I'm going to continue to do so. Just, Just be patient. Things will work themselves out with the personnel that's there. Otherwise, those folks wouldn't be playing in those positions and the trust that the coaches have in them wouldn't be there if they weren't out there on the pitch in the first place. Yeah, it's just well, a process. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so this is what we asked for. If you are if you are an Atlanta United fan, this is what you asked for. You asked for a winning team right out of the gate. We have that. The difference is is that when you look at European competition, domestically, some of the teams that go far in Champions League have to take an L domestically here and there in, in order to stay competitive in the Champions League. That's, it's, it's what you have to do. You have to do some squad rotation. You, you, know, you have to rest certain people. Injuries get picked up here and there. And you never are able to field your 100% top flight lineup day in and day out. But if you want to be a competitive team and a top tier team, you have to get recognized not just domestically but internationally. So as Atlanta United comes along, now we're MLS Cup champions, well, what's the next step? International competition, CONCACAF Champions League, and then hopefully, if you win it all, FIFA Club World Cup where you could see Atlanta United take on a Bayern Munich or a Real Madrid or a Manchester United in actual games that mean something. And so if you want a successful team that goes to the next level, this is part of the process. Take an L here or there. It will be okay. We are in the infancy of the season. The sky is not falling. <laughs> I, and, if it, and if it does fall, I'll be the first one to eat crow. But just keep in mind that the, the, the talent is there. It's not like the talent. It's not like on, a, on Space Jam when the space aliens come down and suck up all the NBA players' powers and you become superstars themselves. That, it's not like that's the case. The talent's there. The ability's there. The coaching's there. The sports science is there. So just be patient and let this process work through this crush of games. Who would right. be the Sean Bradley of that? Like, oh, they sucked his talent away. But did they really? <laughs> did they really need to cast Sean Bradley in Space Jam to begin with is There's my question. also that. All right, we're going to let that marinate for a little bit. You guys catch your breath. We're going to get Jessica Sharman from the Unrelegated podcast on with us. We'll get some more reactions because we don't have enough reactions on a Monday just yet. You guys are starting to chime in with your reactions on Twitter. We're going to get to those as well. Don't worry. All the reactions on an overreaction Monday. Reaction. With us. We'll be right back. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. 
For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Soccer down here, over there, at night, whatever, weird times, weird things. We're trying to make the best of it. It's an overreaction Monday, so we're getting all of the reactions about yesterday and some reactions looking ahead to Monterey. We wanted to get Jessica Sharman from the Unrelegated Podcast on to give some reactions, and let's we'll get your reactions about the game. I'm going to flip this on you because we just had a conversation in the break about the goalkeepers' union and something we have not talked about yet. The comments from Bill Hamid that were given back in January but dropped by MLSsoccer.com, ooh, I, I want to say a few hours before the game. I think we saw them as we were walking into the stadium yesterday afternoon. Jess, you had an interesting thread on, on Twitter about this, and I was shocked that it actually was said. I thought it was kind of strange yeah. to even come out. Absolutely. I mean, I I don't want to speak on the behalf of all goalkeepers here, but I mean, I started playing in goal when I was four years old, and it was always sort of instilled in me that goalkeepers stuck together. Um, goalkeeping practice is a very different thing. You kind of are always part of a group and even though you're competing against each other whether within your team or against other goalkeepers you're kind of always taught that it's it's the hardest position on the field and maybe I'm biased at that point but it's the most mentally draining it's the most pressure and everyone always looks at you whether you're hero or zero so it's kind of taught that you're going to have respect for the other goalkeeper at the end of the day of course you want to win the game but you kind of want your opposition number to do well and I thought it was kind of tasteless from Bill Hamid to make those kind of comments um again like I say probably bias as a goalkeeper we we kind of see ourselves a little bit classier than that that's kind of the things you leave for the strikers the strikers are the arrogant ones <laughs> the strikers are the ones that wear I'm sorry but I'm gonna be real here the strikers are the ones that wear the bright colored cleats you know the 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 sparkly shiny shoes the goalie stick in like black I again I'm traditional I like to wear my my, my black shoes my I think I maybe wore some pink gloves once upon a time when I thought that was fashionable, but keep it clean, keep it real, keep it um, sophisticated. And I think that Bill Hamid kind of broke an unwritten rule there. And I think a lot of goalkeepers would be a little bit shocked that he sort of just saw himself as better than everyone else. And maybe his stats might say that. I'm I'm not sure, but I, I think that's something you keep to yourself. And you always have to be humble in goal because – like I mentioned, and as Brad Guzan saw last uh, last night, it takes a split second as a goalkeeper for a, a humbling error to take place. And you go from, you know, Brad Guzan is our clean sheet hero, but let, let's be honest, he let in a goal that he'll look back. And I mean, I read his post-game interview. He knew he should have done better. And I think goalkeeping is an unforgiving position. Um, strikers can miss 20, 20 shots in a game. They score one, one goal and... You know, everyone's cheering their name. As a goalkeeper, no one forgets that because you can't wipe off a goal off the record. So uh, for me, it showed a disrespect for Guzan. And I think he did a very good job. I know uh, I wasn't too impressed with the question that was asked of him afterwards. I thought that might be a, a bad timing to ask a goalkeeper, you know, what they thought of a, another goalkeeper's comments after he's made an error. But I thought he dealt with it very maturely. And Brad Guzan kind of showed the true side of the goalkeeper union is he didn't call Hamid out. He didn't really criticize him, but you could tell he was a little bit bothered by the comments, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it was a, a weird thing to, to come out. And Hamid had said earlier in uh, preseason that he was better than the goalkeepers that were called into the national team camp as well. 
it's it's a fine line, and and I think your perspective on on what it's like to be a goalkeeper is something that you know I don't have. This is this sounds like a striker, you know, bringing this kind of comment to say that I'm better than mm-hmm. other guys in the team. But I mean, it really let's feels be honest. Out of place MLS, for a goalkeeper. we're trying to stir something, weren't they? MLS were trying to stir something by releasing it at that sort of time. I That's feel like a it was some uh, topic. Yeah, that was weird. That was very strange. That I I don't think that was a great. I mean, maybe it's good journalistically. It might have got some juices flowing, a couple of retweets, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure of the uh, motive behind that one. But like you say, he sounded more like a striker, and I don't wish bad on goalkeepers because, like I say, I'm I'm a bit more uh, classy than that. But he will have every goal he has that moment in a season. Yeah, and for me, I just hope that Brad's got it out the way. That was his one and everyone has them. And I mean, you can type in any number of goalkeeping nightmares on YouTube and you can watch every goalkeeper, let one through their legs or let it slip off their hands. Or it, it's just, you can't do that for a striker. I mean, you have the bad misses, but let's be honest, they get wiped off because all it takes is a, a goal and you make up for it um, with goalkeeping it's unforgivable you know it, that that score will always be on on the the score sheet so um I'm glad honestly sounds from a goalkeeper perspective it's better Brad led it in the second goal than the game game losing right. goal so to say right. um I think that would have been even worse if it had been one nil um and I mean the conditions are bad and I'm not going to defend him he knows he should have done better but in those sorts of conditions, anything can happen. And I, I think I even tweeted during the game, we should have been taking more more shots because it was either uh, Bill Hamid or Brad that was going to make a mistake. Unfortunately, it was Brad, but Brad had far more opportunities to m- make a mistake because DC took more shots than we did. I mean, right. Hamid, made, Hamid made one good save and that was the uh, great shot by Eric Remedy. And you saw how difficult that was. I mean, I think in a regular game, he might have even caught that one, but you choose to parry it because, let's be honest, in those conditions, you see it late, it's moving, the ball's wet. I, I just think we needed to take more shots on that sort of day, even from distance. Um, Tito has a strike on him. We know that. We saw him take one or two. It was blocked well by DC, who I felt you know, defended exceptionally, kind of put those bodies behind the ball and never really gave us a chance. But if he'd have had some better shoes on, I'm not sure uh, who who who... <laughs> who picked his cleats out in the morning because he was slipping all over the place. But I just think we need to take more shots in those conditions. Cause like I say, Brad made a goalkeeping error, but I think Hamid would have had a far tougher day in net. Did I read that he got player of the game from DC United, by the way, which is I think crazy. I, yeah. Which is unbelievable. I think uh, that's I DC trying to add, add that. fire, adding fire to the flame. Right. I think I they're just trying to rub salt into the wounds. Cause there's no way he was, the most beneficial player on no, that field. He okay, made he two saves. I mean, he made the the nice save on R- Rometty and he made one a, good save. He made a good save on on Pete Martinez, who took one of those shots that you're talking about from distance, kind of hit it where it was going to land in like around the six, so it had a skip on it, and and Hamid just kind of got his body behind it and and pushed it to the side. It wasn't a comfortable mm-hmm. one, but he was able to to get the job done. What do you think of of DC overall and their performance, and what do you think of Atlanta United's performance? I truly think that uh, DC United is a top team, and I was worried about playing them. Like, I thought we might get a tie out of it, but Acosta is a great player. Rooney, I don't care. There's been a lot of hate on Rooney, but you can't doubt his talent. He may be older, but that guy's a workhorse and. You know, he's come over to the MLS and really made his mark. Um, I thought tactically they were sound. I think uh, they know how to play against Atlanta United and they proved that. Um, I think we were just outplayed. And whether that be DC United played fantastically or we had a poor game, I think it was a bit of a combination for the two. I don't think they were two goals better than us at times. I think, right. again, we had a, a goalkeeping error. And I know you've talked about it previously about... Uh, it wasn't a corner. The corner was given. Obviously, we should defend it. But, you know, you get a bit unlucky with those sorts of decisions. I don't think we played good enough. Um, I don't think it's time to panic. But I do think that right now, the personnel that were in that squad last night probably wasn't suited to uh, Frank De Boer's tactic style. I don't think you can play, you know, wing backs. Ambrose was playing out of position. Uh, Shea had... 
I, I sang his praises all night long at Kennesaw. Uh, I was super impressed. He seemed to show a little bit about why he might have had so many clubs in the last few years last night. I don't want to kind of rule him out right now because I think he showed a lot of potential against Aridiano, but last night there was just something, I think the most frustrating thing about me for Shea was he was getting into decent positions, but he couldn't be a first man with a cross. Um, he had, I don't like to get into their brains, but he had one successful cross against Aridiano where he drilled the ball in low and hard. And it seemed that he was trying that every opportunity last night. You can't do the same crosses. You've got to have variety. And when they were stacking the defense like uh, DC United were, uh, you can't play a low driven cross when you've got three DC defenders between you and the middle man, if that makes sense. Um, Barco was quieter. My big thing about PT is I think we have to be patient with him. Yeah. Um, I think he's got the soccer IQ is just incredible. And some of the balls you see him play are just so smart. We're just, I think the players around him might not quite be on his wavelength yet. Uh, I think I mean, sometimes think he's playing. Miguel, you think back to Miguel Almiron and the way he played. P.T. Martinez plays very differently. He he does have that soccer IQ that I think it's off the charts, and he has the technique to back it up. So he's seeing things very differently than Miguel yeah. did. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the team and is still getting used to what that's like. Exactly. And they're not quite making the runs that he's used to his players making. It takes time to get used to a new playmaker and start making those runs and it's going to take practice and I think you mentioned earlier we had a great preseason and maybe we got a little bit ahead of ourselves and thought that's what we were going to expect but I think you can't write pity off there's a reason why he was South American player of the year he's an incredible talent it's just going to take time to kind of get used to his style make those runs but once something clicks it's going to be electric and I think the most important thing is that we as fans, and I don't like telling people what to do, but you have to stick behind someone and not get frustrated because you saw some of that frustration coming out in pity, you know? Um, I'll be honest, I was a little disappointed when, do you remember the the penalty call when he just stayed down on the ground for about 25 minutes? Yeah. That was was tough to see because for me, you know, you're 2-0 down, you've got to get up and get hustling. But you can tell he cares, you can tell he's frustrated, and I think... What's going to happen with PT is once he gets that first goal, once he gets even that sort of first real nice link up play assist goal, once Joseph finishes one of them, he puts put a couple of balls in on Joseph that I think he should have done a little bit better on. But once something clicks, the floodgates will open. And I hope that happens sooner rather than later for everyone's perspective, for everyone's sort of stake of mind, because I think otherwise... <laughs> yes. We as fans, let's be honest, we're, we're naturally fickle. We spend money. We spend a lot of money on a team. So... I get why people are saying, hey, be patient, come on, we shouldn't expect a lot. But at the end of the day, when people are spending their hard-earned money, they want to see wins. You know, it's natural. And when you're spoiled, let's be honest, we've been spoiled the last two years with results. It's it's going to be tough when things aren't going right. So I understand the frustrations. So I think as soon as something clicks, the better, just for, you know, everyone's peace of mind. And I can see it coming very soon. Yeah, I, I will completely agree with that. Um we can't have you on and not talk about where you were on Saturday. You were up in Nashville, right? Yes, sir. For the She Believes Cup. Uh, U.S. England was kind of a wild one. I was traveling and did not get to see it. So tell us a little bit about what you think after a day of She Believes and where the U.S. women are and where England is because the U.S. haven't really had a great tournament so far. (laughs) And I think England is probably feeling pretty good about where they stand right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a 2-2 game. Uh, I think it was pretty even. If you look at the stats, the USA definitely had a better of it. But I'm a big believer in the stats don't tell the full story. And out there, I think that the uh, USA team kind of struggled. It was very scrappy a game. Um, Not really connecting passes as well as they probably should and have been used to. And I think England, I don't want to say we're a dirty team, but we're a physical team. And I don't think the USA liked it. Uh, the USA has got to sort out their goalkeeping situation. Again, not to bore everyone with talking about goalkeepers, but uh, Adriana Franch, I think Adriana Franch is her name. She started, had a big role to play in the uh, the first England goal, picked up a back pass, uh, just lack of concentration. Mm. And from that moment on, the whole defence wouldn't play a back pass to her, no matter how much trouble they were in. And I think that, the USA has been spoiled with goalkeepers in the past. I mean, you look back at Hope Solo, which is the era I grew up in, and 
as much as she had her issues off the field, she was a game changer, you know, uh, really the core of the USA team when she played. And I think that replacing someone like Hope Solo is uh, near impossible, really. Um, Rapino, I don't know if you've seen the goal, Jason, but she hit a, like a lovely half volley. So I think they've got goals in them, the USA, but uh, it's about the connecting pass in the last third. And I think defensively, they look a struggle. And I think if you're an England fan or an England coach even, you're really thinking you're in for a good shot because the USA, obviously, they're a powerhouse. And when you tie 2-2 with them, you beat Brazil. I mean, I think Japan's actually the team that's in the lead in the She Believes Cup right now, but England have a chance of winning it. And as much as it doesn't mean much, it's a good start to have um, going into the World Cup. And I think you have to take it a little bit more seriously in a World Cup year because it's four of the best teams in the world playing together. And every game has been close so far. I mean... The, the biggest win's been Japan beating Brazil 3-1, but even there, the last two goals were scored within the last 10 minutes, and Japan used about 22 subs. I mean, I saw, there's, no, there's no subbing rule in the She Believes Cup, and I think they literally changed the full team. So um, it was really interesting. I would touch on Alex Morgan. I know she's one goal away from the elusive 100, and I think that might just be getting to her a little bit because right. she hit a couple of goals that you would have had you know, you would bet your house on her scoring. I mean, like, penalty spot finishes with no one in front of her and she blasts them over the bar. But I am super excited for the World Cup and this has only made it more so because there's such uh, an even level of playing field out there now. And it used to be between for the World Cup that you would be able to, you know, the USA were going to walk through or at least walk through to the final. But I think this year it's going to be a real interesting one, particularly if they don't, find a goalkeeper that they're comfortable with because I think that being able to play back to a goalkeeper and start your uh, offense from your defense is key in a game. And when your defenders aren't comfortable playing the back, ball back to your goalkeepers, you're really in trouble. So I'm, like I say, June can't come quick enough. And I think it's going to be a great uh, advert for female soccer. And one thing I'd like to point out is, you know, it's Nashville, it's freezing cold. It must have been you know, wind chill of like 34 degrees, yet the stadium, I think nearly 25,000 people came to watch, which isn't a bad turnout for a, you know, a friendly competition. Right. Um, so it's just great to see how women's soccer is growing. And what was even nicer is to see the difference in groups coming. There were groups of, you know, stereotypically female soccer is uh, either going to have a larger female fan base or young families, but there were you know, bunches of 30-year-old guys watching with their group of guy friends. And I think that truly shows that women's soccer is gaining more credibility among your average soccer fan. And that's so important to this game. And people really need to start getting behind it and giving it that credibility because uh, the women are catching up. And, of course, it's a different style of play. Of course, women are offering different things. Maybe it's not so fast or physical, but technically – and anyone that doesn't believe that women's soccer players can be just as technical as men need to look at Marta because that, that was a, like watching Ma- watching Marta play. And obviously it's the first time I've done it in person was just incredible. Her ball movement, her her vision is just unbelievable. So, yeah, female soccer and the World Cup is going to be really important. And we talked about it last time we spoke on air, Jason, about how important it is that the media plays a role in that. And I'm excited that we're going to be showcasing you know, female soccer all through the World Cup. Yeah, I think this World Cup is going to be a, a watershed moment because, one, I think there's just more contenders, and, two, I think what you hit on about a, a variety of folks in the stands watching these games, I think that's only going to continue to grow because the level is so good now. The games are far more competitive. And, yeah, okay, maybe it's not quite as fast. If you want to find something to nitpick on, maybe that's it. Mm -hmm. But technically, tactically, and that's something I've always loved about the women's game. I think the tactics really shine through. It's very, very interesting. And now this competition, I think, is more interesting than it's ever been. I would maybe lean to saying France is the favorite. I was going to ask you that. Who would you you put your uh, money on, Jason? If I was going to the betting window right now, it'd be France. I mean, they're at home... I think they've looked the most impressive, but you look at the She Believes field, it's pretty even with maybe Brazil being the most disappointing, you know, and, mm-hmm. and they all are different. 
Japan is super technical and, and maybe not as physical. England, like you said, they can play very aggressively. Yeah, they all have the, their different ways. And that's, that's the thing that we talk about in MLS a lot, too, is you have teams that are developing identity. And now I think in the women's game, you have different countries that are developing identities to their national teams. I think, honestly, the one that maybe doesn't have that identity right now is the U.S., yeah, and I agree with that. And I think the stigma, at least with the U.S. around other countries, is just that the U.S. is fast and sort of direct. And honestly, that's easier to play against. And I think that's what England did. They mm-hmm. sort of defended scrappily and they cut off those long balls and they fouled in the right places before they could play those balls through. And I think the U.S. was shaken up and the fans were shaken up. And when you can hear the fans getting worried, and you're on home soil, I think England capitalized on that. And I'd have to tell you that I think the home advantage is going to be what pushes France over the line. But I think it could be a very different World Cup to what we've seen in the past where there's been a lot of sort of uh, big, big results against teams, you know, uh, easy, easy wins. And I think this year will be the first true World Cup where it could be anyone's anyone's, uh, way through, if that makes sense. Yeah, I feel like this is the most can I join tournament in? they've had. Yes, Nick, go ahead. I feel like I need to join in here because this is, is <laughs> as, uh, as a former employee of the Atlanta Beat, women's soccer and the advancement of women's soccer means a lot to me. So uh, when you look around right now and you see the investment that's going on with in Italy and in England, how much of an effect do you think that has had? And I know this seems like a very dumb question, but it seems like out of nowhere, the women's game has just exploded internationally. Mm Because for a long time, it was just the U.S. And I feel like now with the investment, not just in the the U.S., but abroad, how much has that really helped those other countries that may not have been traditional women's powers, like Italy, you know, and and England now seems to be skyrocketing up. How much has that helped in in the women's game overall? Are are you Nick, yeah, I would tell you it's huge. I'd tell you it's huge. Um, even just five, six years ago, I was playing in, you know, the women's uh, Premier League at the time for Reading Ladies when I was sort of looking at my career and future and uh, my future in soccer, rather. And the only option was to come to the USA and play college soccer because there wasn't really that professional level in England that was going to give you an option to make enough money to pursue a career. So a lot of the talented young girls in England five, six years ago and further along than that, we're having to, you know, head to the USA. And that's problematic because when you're not being in your country year round, you're not playing with uh, people, you're not being recruited by the national team, for instance, you don't have that consistency. So we were losing a lot of our talent and people from countries all over the world were losing talent to the USA. But now there's these options for women to train every day and to play every day but in their home country without having to go abroad to the USA so I think it's a huge uh improvement and then honestly the USA while the other countries are improving the USA is kind of just plateauing um in England like I like I think uh Jason and I spoke about there's now two tiers of professional soccer and that's in a country the size of England what does the USA have in a country its size how many how many female professional teams are there? I think it's, is it uh, 10 or 12 maximum? Which not, it, yeah. it just baffles. Not even. Not even, right? Is it nine? Nine in the NWSL. And Sky Blue will will maybe put them as half. So maybe eight and a half. Mm. And there's a couple WPSL teams that are maybe semi-pro-ish. Maybe. And most of the rest are amateur. Um, there's a huge gap, and there's a lot of parts of this country that are not being served, and that needs to change. And I think that's one of the main reasons why the professional leagues grow in other countries and women are catching up. I think the USA did so well in the past because most of the time its players were the only ones playing full time. Right. But now you're seeing game these players helped that it grow too. Mm-hmm. The college game gave it a, a platform and a foundation that other countries didn't have until the professional leagues got started. Now it's flipped. So I think the USA is going to have to do something about expanding. We talked about it again that, you know, in England, 
the majority of professional men's teams now have a female outlet. And I think the MLS has to look into sort of some sort of expansion that it's included almost in the package, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's something that MLS needs to consider. And I think now that you have more clubs on solid footing financially, it's it's something that can, I think, accentuate your brand and grow your brand and grow your club as a whole and be part of that as opposed to being a completely separate team over on an island over here or being, you know, something that is being forced upon you by the league and and you don't really have the money to do effectively. I think those things are out the window now. And you have a lot of clubs that are successful in MLS and USL championship, to be honest. I think, you know, a club like Louisville City would be a great fit. And they've talked about NWSL. North Carolina does a great job with the courage. Um, obviously, we, we all think Atlanta United would knock it out of the park with a professional women's team here. I think Cincinnati would be another market that would be great for women's soccer. There's so many parts of the country that are not being served, and now you have enough MLS teams and USL championship teams that are doing well enough financially. They're not looking at, okay, what do we have to do to keep the doors open? They're looking at what can we do to grow? Mm -hmm. I think women's soccer is a big way for these clubs to grow. Couldn't agree more. I I tell you what I want, though, is we grow the women's game here stateside. I I want – serious marketing i felt that was one thing that was missing with wps and and the previous uh in its former life anyway and it, it's just something where i i know that it's it's a business and it has to be run as a business but at the same time part of a business is properly marketing your product and mm-hmm. i just feel like that's one area where the women's game has really suffered because when we had the the um the all-star game here in kennesaw and I got to play with the players, and I have no problem touting that till the day I die. Because when you're playing with Christine <laughs> Lilly and Marta and Hope Solo and Abby Wambach, and, and you're getting seeing schooled. it up close, oh my God, Marta, <laughs> Marta was doing Marta was doing crossovers, staring at me like she was ready to stab me. It was she's just incredible. Oh, she's incredible. And I think that if you have an opportunity to see these athletes up close, personal and you get blasted to your living rooms, people will show up. And I think in combination of, of having it in the right market is also making sure that people know that the product exists and it's available and it, you need to go and be a part of that business and be a part of growing the game. So that way, when girls do come up, they don't have to either go just stateside or to Sweden or to Finland, but there's opportunities for them globally to expand their playing ability and playing opportunities. So on that front, Absolutely. as we finish up, let me ask both of you, both of you this, uh, this question. The lifetime deal was canceled by, it, it sounds like both sides were okay with canceling that. So no TV right now. Now maybe this will change as the year goes on. It's all on Yahoo Sports. The lifetime deal was a big thing for the league at a time when they needed it. Talking about that marketing Jess, do you feel like it was a good place for the NWSL to be, or do you think it kind of held it back? I think it's just a stigma attached to it, and Nick's talking about the way to market it, and it, it's just not a sports channel, if that makes sense, and it just seems yeah. that it's not on an equal footing. One of the things I'm so proud about in England is that BBC Sport shows the Women's Super League. It's not on some spin off channel which is, I mean, what's shown on Lifetimes, like dramas, TV dramas, melodramas, chick flicks, right? Pretty much. Yeah. And it, it, it just seems that it, it's not an equal playing field and it's not, it doesn't really show the respect to the female game that it deserves. And yes, it was important that the games were shown on TV at all, but it's just the way you spin things and the way you word things. And Nick's talking about appropriate marketing. And I think it's very careful that you spin the female game in the right way. I'm not going to get started on it, but there was a campaign where women's soccer was compared to Disney princesses. And to me, that just mm. isn't the route to go down. It's no. about showing that women are strong and powerful and athletic. And yes, they can still be feminine, but they're not princesses. You know, you wouldn't call a, a male soccer player a king or a prince, you know, like in that sort of context. So I think it's about marketing in the right way. And I hope that women's soccer gets a platform on a legit sports channel like we talked about in 
uh, the Latino leagues where right. they get airtime against, you know, other Latino male soccer teams. It's very important to me that it's on the same level and not just sort of pushed away on the side on some channel that you wouldn't usually con- connect with soccer. Right. Well, it, it, and it, full it, credit, it, Nick. One, 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 one second. Full yeah. credit to Lifetime for the production of it. I, I thought the fact that they they gave it a shot and the, the money <laughs> they put into it, they were really well produced broadcasts. That part was great. I just don't think it fit there. So, what do you do next, Nick? Look, I, I think it, I think she nails it. You have to put it on a network that actually makes sense. That actually has viewership. I, I think that if you were to put it on, you know, ESPN, Fox Sports, BN, have it on there where there's soccer heads who will watch it because I I know that I will watch women's soccer just as I as much as I will men's soccer, and to me that's part and parcel of the process to sit there and shove it on a lifetime, you know, right after you know I'm battling my ex or whatever show they want to put on there, it, it, that's that, it, it's a joke and it, you know I don't want to make it sound like. You know, I, I I lived through the days when we were trying to find time on Fox Soccer Channel, and it was it was okay, fine, but it didn't get the the airtime that it deserved, and it needs to be on a prime time network where you can get viewership, and somebody has to take the gamble. Somebody has to say, okay, I see it. We're going to put it up there and let's see how it goes. We'll give it two, three, four seasons. Make a commitment and then watch the numbers. They will grow. Somebody took the gamble on MLS. Somebody took the gamble on, you know, these, if they're, if they're showing, if, if they're showing, uh, you know, these ESPN, the Ocho sports, they can find room and they can find time for women's soccer. The product's there. I promise you. Absolutely. Uh, Jess, thanks for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. Let's let's do. We'll definitely be doing this again because Unrelegated takes over our show on Mondays. Um, I think we get Riddle next week, which is always fun. Um, Let's also get another Women's Soccer Weekly podcast together after She Believes Cup is done and maybe go through it a little more in detail and and go through uh, what we've learned in a World Cup year out of these uh, matches and maybe across the board because I want to get into the attendance. I want to get into you know, what we learned about Brazil and Japan since we didn't really talk about them today. And the finals are tomorrow. So I know the game, the U.S. game is on FS1, but the game that's probably going to decide the cup is going to be streamed on USsoccer.com between England and Japan and I want to say it's four o'clock or four thirty. it's it's an early game check that one out because that should be a blast to watch I cannot wait looking forward to it. Well, we'll catch up and we'll break all that down on an upcoming women's soccer weekly podcast and we'll talk to you again soon on SDH on unrelegated Mondays thanks Jess thank you thank you we're gonna take a quick break and reset we'll be right back As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. 
This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Welcome back. A little soccer over there rejoined for you. We'll be getting into some of the soccer over there in a bit, but it is an overreaction Monday, and we have some reactions. We have folks. We have thoughts. We have people talking at us, and we need to talk to them. Brad Ginchy on Twitter says this. With Pitti and Barco on the pitch, they both seem to demand the ball and want to dribble at players to create. Is Barco holding the ball too long? Brad says yes. And how does Frank DeBoer handle this? He has them play the way they did on Thursday night against Aridiano, in my opinion, because it was different. Um, and that was the second time those two had played together. They played together in Costa Rica, and I would agree. They both were kind of doing the same things. They were not in Kennesaw. If you go back and look at that, it played so much more like a 3-5-2 than anybody wants to give it credit for because Barco was dropping deeper into the midfield and Pitti was staying up higher with Joseph for the most part. Now, it was very fluid, and there was lots of interplay and lots of interaction, and, and guys could swap spots, and that was happening consistently. But Barco was getting more touches in deeper positions than Pitti was. Yesterday was different because it's Tito, who's a different player, different personality. It's going to change it. Tito doesn't really want the ball as much until you're in the final third. He wants to run at players and, and take shots. So he's not looking to get as many touches in the midfield and as many touches on the dribble. It, it's different, and that's part of this process, Nick, that we keep talking about. Like, You look at teams around the world, and they can play the same. I don't even want to go formation because that's something that we're, we'll get to in a second. They play the same philosophy, and they play a philosophy that's consistent when they change formation and when they change players. But you get, when you change the, the personnel or you have a tactical plan coming in, the personality of that group can change, even with the same philosophy, even with the same formation. And that's something that just takes time. Yeah, th- what I saw was a lack of faith. It, it, uh, and it just, and not a lack of faith of, oh, I don't trust these guys. It's more of a, okay, who's going to take charge and who's going to run this game? And who's going to be the one to to handle stuff. And if you don't know who that person's going to be, okay, it's going to be me. So you have creators that creators want to create. And I, I think that that's one of those things where it's part of the growing process. And when that gets worked out, magic will happen. Just, just said it. It's going to be electric when it gets worked out. But when you're swapping personnel right now, that has to be worked out as well. So there's, there, there are levels to this. And yes, maybe Barco sometimes holds the ball when he should shoot. I don't think he holds the ball too long when he's trying to get away from pressure and find an an appropriate pass. But I do think that he could probably shoot a little more. That's just me. It's a preference thing. But when that faith gets worked out, then it's going to be something where even if you rotate the squad, then the team that is available says, oh, okay, we're looking to player X and player X is going to be the one who's going to do this and this. My role is to do this and it will work. But until that happens, there will be games like this. Yeah, the, the faith thing is, is important because I think Barco is still earning a little bit of that respect. Um, the, the ball wasn't really forced to him as much last night. I, I believe Eric Rimetti had the most touches of anyone on the field last night. Uh, but when Pitti Martinez came in and he didn't play for very long, he had a ton of touches for the amount of time that he played, and a lot of passes were, were going to him to try to have him unlock things. When Barco gets some of that as well, or when they're playing together, when Barco or Pitti, either one can do it, but I think Barco has shown that he can in that second leg against Aridiano, when he drops deeper and changes it up a little bit and gives it a little bit different look, it's going to be more effective. If they're in the same spaces wanting to do the same things, it's not going to work. It's, it's two for one. 
But if they can adjust and they get to know each other more and they play with each other a little bit more here, I think it's going to be okay. It just it, it takes time. John, let's go to this one. Uh, Jay Leo, or John Leo. Uh, he yes. abbreviates it, Jay. At Jay Leo 110 on Twitter. Overreaction Spelled correctly, on, by the way. Yes. Well, that's, that's debatable. Some people would argue that. Um, overreaction on roster and formation decisions. I'm very good with a loss if we just parked the Marta bus, countered, and played the B team. With the A team in that weather, eh, I wonder if FDB will vary the tactics. Then again, Atlanta United uses sports science, and Frank DeBoer listens to that, so I don't know. The tactics. Let's go back, John. How did Atlanta United play for almost the whole 2017 season? Pressing. 4-2-3-1. Very consistent. Didn't really deviate from that. The yep. games at Mercedes-Benz when it opened. Same lineups, same shape, same way to play, 100 miles an hour, every time. That was how it worked. It wasn't until the very, very end of that season you started to see some deviation. Year two, yep. you saw more deviation before he settled on something going into the postseason. This is game three of Frank DeBoer. Yeah. It does yeah. take some time to, to build what you want to build. Yes, and uh, John, to the points, and we talked about it in the first segment as well, you're still trying to get your 18, 21, however many guys, all acquaint, acquaint, acquainted, if I could get my upper plate to work, acquainted with each other on the pitch through this formational tweak that Frank DeBoer has. Playing a B team doesn't necessarily aid you a whole lot when you're trying to get your starting 18, and I just used air quotes there, your preferred 18 on the pitch every single time, especially once CONCACAF Champions League is over and you're into Open Cup and you're into league play. So for me, I was perfectly fine with this sports science lineup whoever was you know doing well you had nine of the 11 i get it so for me i was fine because they're still trying to figure each other out and just you know look for substitutions probably in the 60s or something like that when it comes to to life in monterey but of course it's also going to depend on situation as well but until this becomes second nature i think you're going to see a very familiar 18 and a very familiar 11 Will he vary his tactics? I think that you risk confusing your players if you do that. I think, but once again, don't get bogged down in formational ideas because things will change. If you see something with headshots on a piece of paper, it is what it is, but it's going to morph as the game goes along. So uh, playing the B team would not necessarily have been a fan of it. Would I have understood something of a rotated lineup? Sure. But Frank DeBoer was comfortable in, in doing this to get everybody continued to be acquainted with one another. So, uh, you know, I was I was fine with what we saw formationally and with the 18 that went out there yesterday. Look, I'm not going to okay. tell you that that Frank DeBoer what he should do, what he shouldn't do, because I'm not there every day. I'm not seeing this team train. I don't have access to the sports science numbers. I don't know where the fitness levels are. I thought right. there would be a little more rotation just because of yeah. looking ahead at Monterey. But you did see Gressel sit for 60 minutes. You did see Pitti sit for 60 minutes. I'm assuming there was a reason behind it because they came in together, and I think that was planned from the beginning. I think some of it yeah. was, yeah. yes, I'm going to continue to do this, even though we're down 2-0. But I also think that was the idea because you wanted to build these connections. Maybe he wanted to see Tito Vialba with the group up front and see what Tito's got at the stage and see what he, how he can help you. Look, it's going to be a work in, process, in progress, but I think, Frank has more information than we do, and I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because he's living it. And and I like what he's trying to build here. I think what he's building in the end can be even stronger than what it was. I think yeah. what Atlanta United was, and one second, Nick, I think what it was was a team that was very good but had to change its idea of playing in the postseason to win MLS Cup. I think if Atlanta United gets their head around this style of playing, this type of possession work, this fluidity, 
it won't have to change who it is. It will be what it is, and it will be better than anybody else in the league, but they're not there yet. And the way you get there is by continuing to do it, even when it's a little rough right now. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is that if this had been like year two, year three of Frank DeBoer, then I think you're probably looking at a legitimate, true JV B-list lineup going out against D.C. Because right. everyone would know 100% where they're supposed to go, what they're supposed to do in, in certain situations. But in this, you have to use it. When we talk about sports science, it's also coming into, hey, look. Now, it's not just worrying about today's game. It's worrying about the game in Monterey as well. These players, if you run them out for this much, this long at this work rate, they will be good to go for Monterey. And saying that, what it also does with Frank's lineup is it allows you an opportunity to get players more accustomed to each other and allow them to work out certain, certain situations in a competitive situation. It's one thing to do it in practice where you're throwing against the wind, for lack of a better term, but in a competitive game, it allows you to say, okay, we can mess up here. We can take chances. We can take risks. We can work things out. And while we may not get the optimal result, it, it, it's better here in DC than having to deal with goal differential with Monterey. So I, I, I get where people are coming from with, with that. But again, it's not, it's not chicken bones and Ouija boards when it comes to roster development and roster construction here. It's more of, okay, it's year one, game three. How can we get these players ready for this game and the game in Monterey and the game after that and have them walk out with minimal injuries and with reducing the the stress on their bodies as much as humanly possible? And John Sosby has has a comment here um, on an overreaction Monday. It says, the depth at both wingbacks uh, is an issue. Resting Gressel was smart. He'll have to deal with Pabon in Mexico as well as join the attack. But an inverted Ambrose was not ideal now. Hopefully Escobar returns soon. I think an inverted Ambrose was what you had to do to give Gressel a rest. You didn't have another option. And if, it, if you're not going to turn to Gordon Wilde in that situation, then I think you're saying that Mikey Ambrose is ahead of him on the depth chart. There's been a lot of talk about Mikey Ambrose from yesterday, but but guys, I mean, I honestly can't think of anything he really did wrong. He no. didn't get forward a ton. He had a right-footed cross, his off foot, that did force Bill Hamid to deal with it. He defended well. Yeah, he didn't really give up much on his side. I, I It happens, like... You know, I mean, to see a, a left-footed guy on the right side or a right-footed guy on the left side, even in the back, it's not completely crazy. I thought Mikey was fine. Um, I think you do are, you are a little thin at wing back right now, but now that you yeah. know, okay, hey, Mikey can play on the right side, cool. He can play both sides. That's good for depth. That's good for your 18 because you can put him in either spot. I think he could play as a center back in the three-man center back line as well if you needed to. George Bello taking a knock in training and being out for a little bit, that hurts. Franco Escobar's injury definitely hurts. Nothing you can do about those two. So you're dealing the best you can. And I think Breck Shea has been inconsistent, but you're seeing glimpses. I think Gressel has been very good so far. Defensively, still needs a little bit more improvement. And as a whole, the wingbacks and the rest of the team just have to get a little more in sync. And I thought the second game against Aradiano was a good sign of that patient possession, getting the wingbacks forward. Got a little more disjointed yesterday. It To me, John, it shows the value of scoring first. You get yes. that early goal, you can play your game. You don't. This team right now has a tendency to get frantic and get away from the game plan. Yeah, and you saw there were, you know, for me, there were a couple of moments where uh, – DC United found ways around Breck Shea. Shea seemed to kind of drift inside a little bit, and they would work themselves around the edges and get past him on a couple of instances. And, yeah, I mean, Mikey Ambrose, for me, it was what you had to do. And for me, there wasn't really a whole lot that was wrong in what he did. It was just odd seeing him on that side. And you're hoping that Franco Escobar gets healthy quickly. And you're hoping that all these other, you know, the bellows knock isn't too serious. And then the, the depth that's there and the situational uh, plugging in will continue. But for me, can we talk about the back line a little bit? 
Sure. Miles Robinson continues to impress for me. 100%. I thought he was, again, the best of the group. Um, I don't think it matters where you play him. Honestly, I don't think the, the positioning matters if those three are in sync. And Miles, I think, again, uh, you look at the numbers. I mean, it's there. The production is there from him last night. Three tackles, two interceptions, eight clearances. He gained possession nine times. He led the team in tackles, clearances, interceptions, and was one off of gaining possession back from LGP. That's that's pretty ridiculous. And then you look you know, a step beyond, which a lot of people have wondered about Miles Robinson and, and can he be effective in these things. 73 passes on the night at an 80.8% clip. He had 31 passes in the opposition's half as Atlanta you know, played in D.C.'s half a good bit at a 77% clip. He was effective in all phases of the game last night. And for me, you know, like it's, I'm looking at the continued growth. And, and, you know, you and I saw Miles last year working with ATOUTD2. Subtle plug, their season starts this weekend. And that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, a John Gallagher and see where his game continues to, to grow and, and all of these other pieces, Vince and Conways and things like that. And I think that the, the value of an ATL UTD2 helped solidify Miles and gain his confidence and continue to grow in that first step. And now you're seeing those other steps where Miles is is putting the pedal down here for Atlanta United on a regular basis. Okay, now here's one, Nick, I want to get your thoughts on because we haven't talked about this yet. Michael Ruiz asked, do you do y'all feel we're asking Remedi to perform too much ball handling? Um, 8-10 type of responsibility so far this year. That's not his skill set. Seems like he's dribbling a lot more than I ever remember last year. I don't know if it's not his skill set, to be honest. Um, he is doing more on the ball. That, that's a definite. Uh, he led the team in passes last night. And that's something that, that Mike Conti and I were talking about afterwards. The numbers on Remedi are different this year. There, there are more touches, more passes. He's more of a fulcrum in the middle of the field. But for a, a number 6-8 in a 3-4-3, three, three, Nick, I mean, this is pretty common for that role, and I don't think yeah. there's any problems that he's had with it. No, I, I, and I think this is, a, is actually a good thing. Let, you know, let him develop another facet of his game. That only makes him uh, you know, the, the, the best way I can equate it is that if you have a tight end in football who is an excellent receiver and an excellent blocker, the tight end may start off as an excellent blocker, but then once he starts showing hands, all of a sudden you have a new weapon to add to your team. And I think it's the same thing here with, with, uh, with Eric in that, yes, he was a, originally that bulldog to, to come in and help shut down attacks. And when you have somebody who can now be an excellent passer as well and help distribute the, you know, the ball, then that's, that's a good thing. And, and, you know, yeah, to start off with, it may be a little more than what we want him to do. Uh, people expect, excuse me, but I, I definitely don't think that's a bad thing at all. I mean, the guy's going to develop, he's going to do great things. And, and I, before too long, how many games may hinge upon Rometty's passing ability? I'm, I'm perfectly okay with this development. Yeah, I think some of it last night, it goes down to D.C. United getting credit because they drop deeper. There's been a, a narrative that I, I think is a little false online about D.C. United pressing. They, they didn't press. I didn't, I didn't see a press from D.C. outside of a couple times that they stepped up high. I mean, a press, you're, you're, generally, you're talking about a team playing high defensively, chasing things down. D.C. didn't really do that. Now, in their own half, they, they closed down pretty quick. Around midfield, they were closing things down quickly. I'm not going to term that pressing. Pressing is what the Red Bulls do. What D.C. did was they dropped deeper, so they clogged up things. They made it difficult to get to Piti Martinez, to Barco, to Joseph in dangerous spots, to Tito. So, Eric Rometty has to step up. Darlington Nagby have to step up. The possession was good from them last night. They did what you want those roles to do. You had, between the two of them, 76 passes from Rometty, 71 from Nagby. Rometty passed at an 88% clip. Nagby at a 95.8% clip, which is just ridiculous. 
And then passing accuracy in the opposition's half, Rometty had two-thirds of his passes in D.C.'s half at an 84% clip, not really much of a drop-off. Nagby actually was better in D.C.'s half, 43 passes, 97.7% clip. He had like maybe one bad pass in D.C.'s half. But what you need to go from there, now that you have this baseline, okay, you can trust Rometty, you can trust Nagby in possession in the other team's half, all is good. Now you've got to get more of those passes going into the final third. You've got to have that penetration that you didn't really have enough of last night. It felt like there was a wall at the edge of the final third, and it was probably built and constructed and maintained by Russell Canals. And Atlanta really couldn't unlock that on a regular basis. That's something where you need that creativity from a Barco, from a Pitti, from a Joseph, and you need to get them on the same page to be able to break those types of teams down because I can see more teams looking at what Aridiano did in leg one, what DC did in leg two, with two central midfielders that can control the game a little bit, and that's going to be a problem. The way you combat it is either with skill of your individual, your flair guys, or Remedi and Nagby doing a little bit more of those eight and a half 10 type of roles, those flying eight kind of roles, and getting involved with the late runs, that's how you're going to open things up. It's going to be interesting to see, but right now I still think Frank DeBoer and Atlanta United are implementing plan A. How much of a plan B will there be? Um, Ask your boy uh, Maurizio Sarri about plan Bs. He doesn't really like to go there. Until no. he's got his plan A the way he wants. And then what he does, and I thought what he's shown a little bit with some of the criticism, is you can make some little tweaks to your plan A. You can change personnel a little bit. You can move pieces around and still play within your plan and find results. I don't think Atlanta's there yet. It just takes time. No. It, it, it's what we talked about uh, in the early stage when we talked about how uh, you know what went wrong at Crystal Palace and, and with Frank DeBoer and well, where Crystal Palace said, well, how long is it going to take for you to implement this system? And Frank said, six months. And they said, okay, cool. And they panicked and yeah. they pulled the plug. And that's because they had moments like this. And keep in mind, Atlanta yeah, United. Not even like better. this. I think they were worse. Yeah. I think their moments were much worse than these. I completely agree. And, and Atlanta's doing infinitely better th- with uh, implementation than Crystal Palace was. So, you know, it, it's going to take time to get this going. He's not, he's not unpacking, you know, especially for a lot of new MLS fans that, that have DM me regarding this. What, what I uh, equate it to is you're not unpacking the full playbook yet. You have, you're running your, your base offense at this point, and then you'll start throwing wrinkles and tweaks and things like that. As it becomes, uh, as it becomes more, the foundation is there and in place right now we're at foundation level. So it's going to get, it's going to improve, but you know, there is, you know, the fan base will be looking at Monterey as a referendum. And, and rightly or wrongly, the fan base will be looking at this. And if it goes sideways, if it goes south, you know, Twitter will yet again go full Chernobyl. And, you know, we'll be tasked with putting out fires. <laughs> but, you know, it's I like what is happening with Remedy. I like what's happening with, with PT. I, I think that it's going to click and it's going to be amazing. But, you know, Atlanta United will be okay. The talent level, just remember this, the base talent level that this team has is, uh, guys, can you think of another MLS team that has this level of talent on starting 11 and on bench? No. And and the, the difference when you look, even look back in MLS history is you have the talent and you are really pushing the envelope for how you want to play. Because, I mean, I'm off the top of my head when you look at talented teams in this league's history. The, Tor- the Toronto teams, talented. Um, this last run, talented, and especially the 17 version that had the depth. The LA Galaxy teams with uh, Beckham, Keane, Donovan, Omar Gonzalez, that group, very talented. Juninho, very underrated at that time. Very talented, a lot of balance. The early D.C. United teams, very, very talented. They didn't really, I mean, those early D.C. teams brought some Latin flair, but they played a 4-4-2, pretty pretty basic. 
Uh, the LA Galaxy team's really not a whole lot tactically. It's just our players are better than yours. Now, Bruce would make little tweaks within the system, and I thought he did really well doing that against Siggy Schmid when, when the Sounders teams were right there with him but just couldn't get past it because Bruce would change a little thing here, a little thing there. The Toronto teams, uh, Greg Vanny showed a little bit more flexibility. He would go from a 3-5-2, which was their base, to play in some 4-4-2, some 4-4-2 diamond. He'd mix things around a little bit. But tactically, it really wasn't like any huge revolution. This, it's not a revolution for what Atlanta United is doing because it's just building upon what Tata Martino built. But it's a revolution for bringing, I think, a more... I, I, I don't know how to describe it. I don't know if it's... Because you don't, it's not like England and the continental style. It's not that. It's maybe just a little more mature style of play. It is different. It is not as explosive. It's not meant to be. It's not meant to have uh, players break away like you saw Miguel Almiron do and run down the middle of the field and run past everybody. It's not really built that way. This, this roster is not built that way. This roster is built to control possession, dominate possession, and make it difficult for the opposition to get chances and then get chances yourself with your skill players. It's not happening across the board yet. It takes time. I feel like you're seeing enough glimpses. It's not Crystal Palace. It's not Inter because you have a roster that can play this way. That's why you're seeing some glimpses. That's why you saw what you did against Aradiano in the second leg. Looked great. You saw what the 3-4-3 can be. You saw what this philosophy can be. It's not there consistently yet. And against a good team on the road like D.C. United, you give up the first goal, you're going to have a hard time, especially in those conditions. You don't convert your chances. You don't get enough chances. You're going to have a hard time. That's life in this league. That's life in any league. But I feel like in the long run... Atlanta can get to a higher place than where they were at the end of last year playing this way and under Frank DeBoer. I really do. But I think it's going to take a little bit of time to get there. You know, he said it takes six months at Crystal Palace, and that was going to involve a pretty heavy change in the squad because he didn't have the players who could really do what he wanted to do. And he didn't get that part to start off the six months. But he said six months there, it's not going to take six months here because of the talent you have and the compatibility of what you have. But it is going to take a little bit of time. Monterey is going to be interesting because how does he balance the tactics of the 180 minutes against the best team he's seen so far with continuing to implement and continuing to build? Can he find that in-between that he talked about a little bit before Aradiano with this looking maybe a little more 5-4-1, a little more sit back, look for your opportunities to counter, try to control possession, but maybe a little bit deeper, maybe it's a little bit more of a defensive tactic. Is it going to look that way on Wednesday? That's the big question. We'll get to that tomorrow and Wednesday. We will be live from Mexico Wednesday morning. Myself, Mike Conti, we'll have John Nelson on the phone. John will not be making this trip uh, for his health because he's got a game to call yeah. Saturday, and he's not 100%. No. Where are you? About seventy five percent now. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's pretty close. Uh, the uh, Zycam and the uh, Purple Drink are still my best friends. Well, watch but... the Purple Drink. Don't don't go Little Wayne on us. Or or, or uh, Jamarcus or Russell. Do or it. Jamarcus Riesel. No, no, don't don't go Wheezy. Don't don't do it. We want to but... see it. No, but uh, we're getting there, and as much as it would have been a tremendous chance to see the team in a storied building, the idea of not being healthy, flying in reconstituted air, coming back, and then having to call a match on the weekend and be ready for the the home opener for Atlanta United on Sunday seems somewhat counterintuitive as much as my as much as my 25-year-old self would have loved to have done it, the, the individual who is no longer 25 said no. Okay, a couple things uh, before we take a break and talk a little soccer over there. Uh, Josh Eisenberg is, is laughing at me using the term flying eight because I like to use it a lot. It's, it's fun. It's good. I like it. I like that position, and, and I'm still waiting for Ivy to become the first flying eight in U.S. women's national team history. Come on, Jarrett. 
<laughs> Fine, I'm working on it, but she's right. dominant right foot right now. Oh, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. It's very right footed. Yeah, it's it's very right footed child. An inverter. Right. Yeah, you gotta work. You gotta work on the left a little bit. But you can get there. Uh, the colonel feels like he was watching a different game than me. He probably had a much better view than I did. I can tell you that because he was there last night. I did see him walking by our uh, secluded broadcast booth in the corner of Audi Field. Um, he said that. Atlanta United couldn't get out of our half, and they pressed. Uh, Colonel, I'm going to tell you the stats, and I'm going I'm to read some of these out to you right now. Um, Eric Rometty led the team in passes, 76 passes. 51 of those were in D.C.'s half. Miles Robinson, LGP, and Parkhurst combined had quick math. Da, 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 da carry that over there 82 passes in dc's half your center backs were doing that nagby had 43 in the other team's half breck shea had 47 of his 58 passes in dc's half mikey ambrose had two-thirds of his passes in dc's half there was a lot of play in dc's half there was you look at the touch map and go go check out who scored for some of this I've, i'm looking at some of the stats on opta who scored has a lot of this too. You look at the touches and Atlanta United, I think without counting up all the dots all over the field, had more touches in DC's half than they did in their own half. They were getting into DC's half. The problem was they weren't getting into the final third. And that's the the glaring thing when you look at the touch map is there is a wall 22 yards from goal. The top of the arc on the 18 Atlanta United didn't have a lot of touches beyond that. They didn't have a lot of touches inside the 18. I can count that one for you real fast. 5, 6, 7, 8, nine, 10, 11 on the line, and half of those are out in the side of it. That's not good enough. That's, that's not good enough. It's D.C. had more touches in Atlanta's 18 than Atlanta had in D.C.'s 18. And when you go back to the possession numbers, it shouldn't be that way. You're talking 56 to 44%. These are some of the corrections that just have to get better. Um, DC really wasn't high pressing. What, was, what they were doing really well, and you go back to Breck Shea's numbers, and you go back and you look at, okay, he had 47 of his 58 passes in DC's half. Yeah, but they didn't really lead to a whole lot because I thought Leonardo Hara played really well at right back. I thought on the other side, uh, Mora didn't have quite as much to do on Ambrose. He had a little bit more to do when Gressel came on, but he played well. And I thought your, four, your, your box of four in the middle, your two center backs in uh, Birnbaum and Briant, and your two central midfielders, Canals and Moreno, they really made life difficult at the top of the eighteen. At the top, at 22 yards out, that that wall to the final third, they closed it. They shut the gate. They locked it. They threw away the key. Those are things that have to change. Um, sometimes watching games and looking back at the numbers can throw you, definitely. I didn't feel like D.C. pressed. We talked about it on the broadcast a lot. I felt like they dropped and defended really well in a lower block. But they made life difficult for Atlanta. I thought Atlanta's passing numbers would have been far worse. I really did. But it's the meaningful passing, the meaningful possession. You can rack up possession numbers, but it's what you do with it. And Atlanta didn't do enough with it. Five key passes, two shots on goal yesterday with 56% of the possession. And such you know, good passing numbers, you weren't turning the ball over a ton off your passing. It's got to be better. It's just got to be a little bit better. Um, if you guys have more thoughts, go ahead and throw them at us on Twitter, at Soccer Down Here. We're going to take a quick break. We've got some soccer over there to talk about. There was a razor blade involved at some point. Did this really happen? Check. Okay. So we had a razor blade. Um, uh-huh. I don't think we had a possum on the field this time, so that's a shame. I don't know what other madness we had in the world of soccer over there, but I'm sure John and Nick have a couple things to throw into the mix. <laughs> we'll get to those as well as your final overreactions, underreactions, on par reactions after this. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Apple Linsky and Associates. 
personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568. 6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Well, that was our final break. I I think I finally remembered how to make things work after about an hour of doing the show. Uh, Sorry. It's a Monday, and there was travel involved, and it was a bad day yesterday all the way around. So, (sighs) The horrible, no good, very bad day. (sighs) It was one of those But but Hey, Jason. Jason, there were struggles in the beginning, but it seemed to work out okay in the end, right? It did. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting how that works. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Wow. We'll Ooh, see. irony. We'll see. Show irony. Interesting. interesting. All right. Interesting. So tell me well, about this uh, razor blade. Tell me about this yeah. blading incident. What happened? Okay. Where? All right. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of turkey. things that are not ending up all right, is turkey. Yeah, John. Uh, you want to you want to jump in with this to start with? Okay. Uh, Turkish third tier. Ahmed SK and rival club Sakarya Spor. Dude is accused of using a concealed razor blade to slash opponents. You like apples? I like them apples. Go for it, Nick. Yeah, so there's a lot going in on this where there if you know anything about Turkey, you have the Kurdish area and the Kurds. That's a that's a very very tense rivalry there, and in this game, you know, often politics will make their way onto the field, and you see where this guy Mansur Kalar is grabbing at a player's throat. You can see on video where they, he's clearly holding something in his hands, and he goes and he grabs a guy at the throat, and all of a sudden the guy yanks away, and then he cuts another guy on the butt. I mean, it's absolutely bonkers. There's video of this. And they're like, oh, no, we don't, you know, we don't see anything. Oh, we don't know. No, there's video. There's video. And then the images afterwards, these guys are cut open. Like, it is very clear that there there is a slashing weapon of some sort used. And it's, you know, of course, now you have denials and everything else. I don't know how you deny this, John. The video is playing as day. You can find it on Yahoo Sport. You can find it anywhere. Just Google Turkish soccer player razor blade and just take it from there. But. You have faces getting cut, throats getting cut, butts getting cut, and all in the name. You don't of, want a butt cut. No, you do not want a butt cut. And that, and there's a, there's a thing with the uh, supporters groups in Rome where that happens from time to time. So if you go to a, a Roma Lazio derby, just protect your butt because it could happen. So this is something where it, it, it's it's happening and. I, I, I'm at a loss for words. I've never seen this in my life. The only thing I can think of that's even close is when that uh, 
that owner in Greece ran onto the field with his gun. <laughs> like that's as close of uh, of an insane asylum thing that I can see. But yeah, I mean, we're watching the video right now and you can see as the players are lining up uh, for introductions, the guy's clearly holding something in his hand. And right as they're walking away, the first cut to, uh, goes on the butt of uh, player number 21. And then they come up, he grabs <laughs> the throat and there's the second cut. And the guy's like looking back like, hey, guys, what's going on here? You know, something's going clearly wrong. And it's absolutely amazing video. I'm shocked watching it just now. And then he goes to another player's face, acts like he's going to slap the player's face, open handed. And then there's a cut. So I, I think what it looks like is he has the razor blade taped to his finger. Uh, and it looks like it, that way he can slap a player o- with an open hand and still get the cut that's desired. So a uh, special shout out to my uh, in-house producer, Jackie Fresh, a.k.a. the Fortnite King, for running this video back for me so that way I could give you an intense play-by-play. Yes. And uh, the team that went on the defensive. Is. Well, the team goes on the defensive in a release – in a in a pub in a published statement, they said that their players and fans were provoked, and that Shalar did not have a blade, despite images surfacing showing the victims clearly being cut with something. And Sakarya Spore fans invaded Ahmed's locker room prior to the last match to the two teams back in October, and according to local news. Sakarya Spore's security was involved in the locker room invasion, which led to Ahmed SK's coach being kicked. So there's some history here, kids. Good times. Yeah. yeah. And the players who were slashed to press charges in a police investigation has been open. Video and story from Yahoo Sports. So, yeah, that's what's going on in the world. So anytime you sit there and you say, oh, man, I wish uh, American soccer was as exciting and as adventurous as other parts of the world. Just remember that there's parts of the world where players are getting cut with razor blades. So uh, in the words of uh, Wu-Tang, protect your neck at all times. Always keeping it real. Somebody else who is keeping it real, AC Milan, my boys, they are now third in Syria. That this monumental climb. I was wrong about Gattuso. I have to say it because, guys, I've always said if I'm wrong about something, I'm open with it. I don't try to dust it under the rug and keep it hidden. A while ago, I called for Gattuso to be gone. That I should have known better because if you can find a a team that had a better winter transfer window outside of Newcastle, then AC Milan, let me know because Christoph Piantek is an absolute game changer. He drew a red card uh, in in their game this past weekend against Sassuolo, which helped them eke out a 1-0 win. But Meanwhile, Inter Milan absolutely going full Chernobyl, Icardi, this continuing quote-unquote leg injury that is keeping him from being in the starting lineup. Really? Uh, Leg injury? That's what we're going with? Yeah, that's what we're going with, leg injury. Mm -hmm. I take that, whatever. Okay, whatever Wanda wants to cook up is what Wanda's having here. So, What's what's Wanda doing on uh, Italian TV these days? What have I missed? Uh, you, yeah, I mean, it's just the same stuff. We are being, you know, we are. I'm a revolutionary. Uh, we are, you know, we're wow. being attacked by by fans. We're being attacked by the media, and this is the absolute garbage. We're, you know, we're we're being treated so unfairly and so poorly. But you know, it, it, this is a this is a problem because Inter is right on the verge of getting out from under the the sort of Damocles of financial fair play and Champions League money would go a long way to helping them out. So this is something where Inter needs to get the ship righted because Lazio is creeping up ever so slightly. And in Roma, we don't know what they're going to get. Lazio's in sixth, Roma's in fifth. But Roma, just getting shellacked against Lazio, there's word that Eusebio Di Francesco could be on his way out. And uh, Monkey, the sporting director, along with him. And uh, Monkey, who was at Sevilla for a while, a nurse some fan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Had some great talent. But really, it just hasn't worked here with Roma. Roma is in the state right now because they are having to sell a lot of their good players. There's uh, Everyone's freaking out because their starlet, Zaniolo, is, is performing out of his mind. But now Roma faithful are like, okay, if we don't make Champions League, do we have to sell him? So there's a lot going on right now in Syria from a drama standpoint when you go uh, when you get out of the top two. But the, the tournament, the, 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 the Scudetto belongs to Juventus. 
They will not win Champions League because if you watch the game this past weekend, they looked absolutely exhausted. You can just tell that from having the throttle down the whole Serie A season, not doing enough squad rotation, it's really starting to add up. Allegri is under a ton, ton of fire. And there's talk that uh, Antonio Conte could be knocking on the door. So Antonio Conte is either going to end up with Enter or Juve at the end of the season. Just go ahead and flip your coin on which one he gets. So, And there's a word out of England, uh, John, that Mr. Mike Ashley has taken Newcastle off the market. Is this true? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Mm-hmm. God. I guess yeah, uh, I laser that. disc sales picked up. I guess so. Yeah. Laser discs and eight-track tapes. And I uh, uh, pulled the plug on the talks with uh, Peter Kenyon, but... You know they they're still for sale, so I, I guess he's just not happy with Kenyon's offer. And uh, quoting our friend Lee Ryder over at the Chronicle, uh, absolutely just pulled the plug. Extensive talks with Kenyon granted him extra time to get the deal done. Even told Kenyon he was the preferred party to end the twelve year uh, the twelve year ownership, but. Ashley has grown frustrated after Kenyon failed to produce a package worth over 300 million pounds. And it's believed quoting Ryder, he did not satisfy the club's other request of proving they could take the club forward. So right now that's where we are. So they're they're I guess. So depending on who you believe they're off the market again, or they're just uh, still on the market, just that Peter Kenyon is now at the back of the line. Um, uh, Still open to other offers. Club's not necessarily been taken off the market, according to Ryder. But fans on Tyneside are naturally uh, continually angry at Mike Ashley, and this just gives them another reason to be, I guess. Okay, I have a question for you guys. Who would be the first player in MLS to do what Mario Balotelli did over the weekend? Oh. He posted his own goal celebration on Instagram as it happened. Yeah. Yeah. And the photog was in on it. Dude had well, his phone. Yeah, was, yes, no, somebody had to set it up. I mean, you have to be confident that you're going to score, and you have to give your phone to somebody to say, all right, I'm going to run over here, and you better be ready. You better have Instagram ready to go and just click the button to go live so I can do this. No doubt. Yeah, and, 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 and he has absolutely, when we talk about Mario Balotelli, he has absolutely just found himself at Olympi Marseille. It, it's, it's something, it's fun to watch if you if you can get, if, okay, first of all, let me get something out of the way. I have to back up here. If you don't have BN because of the very stupid contract issues, Fanatis now Fanatis. has BN. So for like $10 a month, you can get BN and all – you can get Argentine Super League. You can get everything. Gold? It's yeah. ama- yes, goal TV, amazing value. So you can watch Legal and watch Mario Balotelli do Mario Balotelli things. But yes, to answer your question, I think it's Zlatan. He's the one who would do this. And uh, Jackie Fresh, who do you think would, after scoring a goal, would take their phone, go on Instagram, and show the world their celebration as it happens? Zlatan. Zlatan. Okay, so we're, we're Zlatan for Zlatan over but here. But see, Zlatan can't imitate Mario Balotelli. So Zlatan has to take it to Zlatan another Zlatan would say level. that Balotelli's imitating him. Well, no, he would have his he, he would have be. his own cameraman streaming, like that following him around on the field is what would happen, and then he would go over and grab the camera and be like, "This is the Zlatan goal. Zlatan only scores Zlatan goals for Zlatan Championship," and then that'd be it. Zlatan would, be, would have a microphone. Yeah, Zlatan would give a speech on Instagram after he scores. Of course, That's what would happen? Yeah, it, 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 but. It's still, I, I'm waiting for him to have that moment where he does the Terrell Owens, where he has the Sharpie in the sock, and he pulls the Sharpie out and autographs the ball. And then, and then throws it into say, the stands. Yeah. And then they say, well, did you have the Sharpie in your sock the whole time? He's like, no, just on that play because I knew I was going to score. I want that for Laton. Just do that. Just pull the Sharpie out, sign it, and go. Hold on. Jack, Jack wants to toss in. What do you say? But the problem is, if he has a Sharpie, how does he even get it in there? That's a, well, it's Zlatan. Zlatan would it's find Zlatan. a way. Zlatan. There is no Zlatan. such concern. Yeah, he would well, find a way. It, it, Zlatan really doesn't do a whole lot for large stretches of the game, so he could walk over to the bench, grab a Sharpie, you know, maybe perfect. test it out, then walk back over and score a goal. That, that's kind of how it goes for him. So, 
Thank you. Alvarez Nicole. probably holds the Sharpie for him until he needs it. Well, so, there's uh, that, yes. My my kickback to you guys, Liverpool doing Liverpool things. Ooh. Oh, boy. Oh, <laughs> man. How, you, you draw with Everton 0-0. Zero, zero, well, it's Merseyside. All right, but, uh, but the, the race, what, what's happening with the race? Is the race officially over? Is it done? Has Liverpool absolutely shot themselves in the foot yet again? Yes. They might have, but, I mean, it's not over. It, it's one point. It's, it's level on 29 games, so there's nine games left. Manchester City with a one-point lead, uh, a pretty big goal differential lead of plus seven over Liverpool. So... I mean, Manchester City is going to have to slip up somewhere. Yeah, good luck on that one. Uh, Liverpool's been doing that before. Now they they are. Now Manchester City is in the round of 16 of Champions League. They're in the quarterfinals in the FA Cup. Liverpool's out of the FA Cup, right? I think think they were upset. And this is. Yeah, Liverpool's out of it. Well, and then this is Manchester City's next three matches in league play. Uh, March 30th, they go to Fulham. April 6th, they host Cardiff. April 14th, they go to Crystal Palace. Then, okay. then they host Tottenham, and they go to Manchester United a couple days later. Short rest. Okay. Then they finish up at Burnley, hosting Leicester at Brighton. Yeah, they're, so they're okay. They're going to drop points. It's Tottenham and it's at Manchester United. Yeah, really, that's it. Yeah. So they're so it's it's not dead, but it, it's, it's. You've got it's those two back to back, though. That's the tricky thing. So that okay, maybe Liverpool can take advantage. What does Liverpool have left? Uh, they go to Fulham this weekend. Check. Then they host Tottenham, they go to Ooh. Southampton, they host Chelsea, they go mm. to Cardiff, they host Huddersfield, they go to Newcastle next to last weekend, and then they host Wolves on the final weekend. Okay, so each team has two where they can surrender points in theory. Yeah, yeah there's, there's two so tough ones. We go ones. to who's the most likely to surrender points out of those. Well, that's, that's Liverpool, the way they've looked lately. Liverpool. Yeah, Liverpool. Okay. Uh, can Spurs stay in the top four? I say no. No. So that means I got you Manchester think United. Only Gunnar Solskjaer is going to lead uh, Manchester United in the top four, and they're going to stay in. No, the well, they're already they're, they're top. They're in their fourth place now, but they could. I if, think if they're they, three by they, the time they're done. I I think they're I think they will sit comfortably in third place before it's all over, and. If I'm if I'm Solskjaer, I am telling the brass. If I get you top three, boy howdy, are you gonna pay me to stay there? I, you, you better get you better back up the Brinks truck. You better back up all the because you I think he's still technically on loan. I'm just saying, you better you better give me all the monies to stay because this is a miracle job. They will make movies in Manchester. All the Kruna? About all of it, all of it, because the job that this man has done, it, it's absolutely titanic. And I have a uh, I have a, a Manchester United correspondent who will be joining on future episodes. Jason, get ready. Get your stuff. This is Jason oh. Davies. But Jason Davies, get ready, because we're going to have we're going to have you on in the upcoming weeks talking about Man United and Solskjaer and, and the miracle job this man has done. So okay. it's going to be, uh, but Chelsea, uh, they're going to be on the outside looking in. Arsenal, I, I, you know, eh. I, maybe they, maybe they can get there. But Spurs are, they, uh, you cannot go, and this just shows you cannot go two windows, not get any new players, get any new depth, and expect to maintain consistent results with other tournaments and with domestic play injuries everything else you cannot do it this is not 1964 don't try it so i think if pochettino gets an offer he's gone in the off season and and, and has has the team given him any reason why he should not take such an offer yeah no such so. fantastic levels of investment by daniel levy hey, 
that's going to be an interesting uh, situation because I wonder if Manchester United is going to make him an offer or if they're going to give the job to Ole Gunnar. See, and that's the thing is that a lot of folks are saying that Pochettino is number one on the Manchester United list. But if I'm Ole Gunnar, I'm like, I'm out. You, you're going to go talk to him? I'm, I'm gone. Bye. Exactly. As he should. Yeah, and, he should. And if, if you are the Manchester United fan base, at that point, you need to book every plane in Manchester to fly over the stadium with glazers out, board out, Woodward out, whoever you want. Yeah, I think it's board out. I don't think it's even glazers. They're not making that call. It's whoever's you know running the day to day. Like you've got the guy, the Ed Woodward. Yeah, you got the guy. He's there right now. Me, yeah, and 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 again, remember where this team was early in the season. Under sweet, sweet Premier titles, sweet Premier titles. To go from that, where you were at the event horizon of a black hole, to now you're sitting firmly in Champions League contention. Come on, you can just give the man a deal. Yeah. And 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 again, if you wait to the end of the season, and you're in third place, his value goes up, his leverage goes up, his negotiating value goes through the roof. So go ahead and get Pochettino if you want. That's fine, but you're going to alienate your fan base and possibly wreck any sort of goodwill you have after booting the special one uh, right to the BN broadcast set. We've got some uh, soccer over there, down there news as well. Uh, Aaron Medford from Air Diano is no longer with Air Diano. He was let go what, Friday or Saturday? I guess it would have been Saturday um, after the loss in Kennesaw. So not really a surprise. I mean, 10th in the Costa Rican table, not a shock. He maybe had a little bit of goodwill after that good first leg, but then they lost in league play. They were pounded here and looked bad in doing it. I thought he made some bad tactical moves in that game, and he's gone. So we'll see what happens with Aradiano as the season goes on. But, Nick, your new favorite team uh, needs a win tonight, and they're playing right now. They're in the 31st minute. Defensa y Justicia is on the road at Aldo Civi. It's scoreless in the 31st. The table right now, I think this is the last game of the round. Defensa is six points back from Rossing, but a win tonight would make them three points back with – what's – how many games left? Uh, four rounds left. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's getting down to the wire. Yeah. I, I would like to let everyone know, first of all, I'm a lifelong uh, Defense A Justicia fan. Yeah. Uh, there you guys, go. Representing the, uh, the, the Verde and Gold. You need to be on it. That's, that needs to forget all these other teams. You need to get on board with the greatest team name in, <laughs> in all of sports in my mind, just because it's so metal. Defense A Justicia. But yes, my, my, my boys have to come through. We need a big win. Uh, we didn't do what we needed to do against Boca, but you know, it's okay. That's all right. So if you, if you follow me at, at Nicolifi, you can see occasionally I will retweet uh, my new adopted favorite team uh, in South America. So feel free to join us in this expedition, this quest for the cities of gold. We can do it together. Everyone off on board. <laughs> one team, one fight. It was a tough one. Copa Sudamericano did not go well. They were knocked out 4-0 on aggregate to Botafogo. I think that was a distraction because the the league form has kind of been around That was an ugly game for for Defensa. That was an ugly, ugly game. Botafogo really just bossed them. And and it was if if you had that uh, if you got to watch that on uh, on BN it was something where it, it made me it made me a little sad it hurt my heart as a lifelong defense A Justicia fan but I can tell you that we will we will rebuild we will rebuild we will become stronger all will be well so, so just here's, follow us here's on this what I'm story. hoping the final match day sees Rossing host Defensa. I want that to be for the title because all of the chaos, all of the lifelong Verde y Amarillo fans of Defensa y Justicia will descend upon Racing Club, and that will be an epic, epic match in Argentina. Yes, and, 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 and this is something that we talk about from time to time. 
it's 10 bucks to get Fanatis. And this is a league that's worth watching because one thing I hear about people, I, well, Nick, I try to get into Syria. It's not quite as fast as the Premier League. It's not quite as fluid as uh, as La Liga. There's no drama in, in you know, Liga on. Well, there's a ton of drama in Argentine Super League. It's fast. It's mega physical. It is an absolute riot to watch. And the crowds are, it's, it's like they, they set these games in the middle of an insane asylum and just say, okay, <laughs> it, let's go. <laughs> Weekly it, Thunderdome. It, it is. It's Thunderdome. Like two teams enter, one team leaves. They have riot police who come and escort the, you know, the, 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 the officials off the field with like riot shields and everything. Ten bucks a month. It, it, Fanatis is very quickly approaching my epic hype levels for ESPN Plus. It's getting there. So this is something that you need to put on your radar immediately. Argentine Super League, something you absolutely need to watch because you'll learn a lot about players as they're coming up from South America. Managers that uh, are going to be, no doubt, populating MLS before too long. And before we leave, can we talk about how long Matias Almeida will be in MLS before he bolts, because that man looked like he was ready to blow a gasket this weekend. He's—I mean, he's high strung. Uh, that's kind of how he always is. So I'm—I'm I'm not thinking it's too much of that. I think it's just he demands perfection, and he's in the same situation that Frank De Boer is in, except he's trying to implement a style, and he doesn't have the roster to really do much of any kind of style because he was left with a bunch of eh, eh, spare parts. Eh, eh, it's not good. Um, he, he's trying. It, it, it's interesting. It's going to be fun to watch because it is very different. It is man to man. Most of the field. It, it's really unique. I want to see how it comes off over the long haul. So I'm, I'm intrigued by San Jose. I'll be keeping an eye on the quakes a good bit. But I think it's going to take him some time. He just doesn't have enough pieces to work with. Yeah, and, and it's something where I have read reports that he is less than pleased with their ability to bring new talent in. Um, I, I cannot substantiate that, so I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not sure it. on that. I, I think that could be some shenanigans. I, I don't know if I believe that. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on some of that stuff. I think some of it was coming from Cruz Azul folks who wanted him to come to Cruz Azul as they've had some struggles this year. I don't think there was as much legitimate interest on his side. I mean, he did just go to San Jose. Yeah, stranger things have happened. Paraguay national team. The crazy stuff does happen. I think we should probably end there because I have a lot of Mexican media to study the rest of the night Go. and tomorrow. And then I'm on a plane tomorrow evening heading down to Monterey to call the game. I can't believe we're getting a chance to do this. Um, hey, it's Jason, amazing. really quick before yes. we go. I'm sorry. I, and I really don't want – I'm sorry to do that. But first of all, no, it's okay. it, 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 one thing before we get out of here, we want to give our thoughts and prayers to everybody in Alabama and through Georgia yes. who have been affected by the tornadoes and the severe weather. I hope this show has been able to, to get you guys – if you are remotely affected by this – I just know our thoughts, our prayers, our love all goes out to you. And uh, and big shout out to everybody. And, and Jason, of course, safe travels to you, sir, as you uh, as you work your way to Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. It's flying out tomorrow night. I'll get down there. Everybody else is there. Uh, I have seen some tweets from folks who are on the ground in Mexico. So the team has arrived. Uh, training tomorrow, press conference tomorrow, and then the game, 10 o'clock. It's a late one. It's going to be five stripes after dark again. Um, same channels as before. It's Univision Deportes. It's Yahoo Sports Streaming. We're on WAOK with this one. There's a Hawks conflict on 92.9 The Game. But you can also listen on the Radio.com app and the Atlanta United app. We've got two more days to get you ready and preview this, and we'll be doing that tomorrow starting at 9 o'clock. Joe Patrick, Dirty South Soccer, will be joining us on the show tomorrow morning. We'll also have our first fantasy update of the year um not sure how you guys did i was eh, that was all right yeah join the fantasy league if you haven't and by the way you know who's leading after week one well the commissioner yeah i haven't joined i need to 
Yeah, yes, hi. you do. Do it. Yeah, so the com- so the commissioner is leading after week one. Yeah, wow, that it's needs to change. Calciopoli. Yeah, it could be. We're, we are efforting uh, the commissioner to join us tomorrow morning as well to talk about how he has pulled this off. We'll see what we can get. But uh, tomorrow, 9 o'clock, 9 to 11, normal time slot. Normal time slot on Wednesday. Thursday is TBD, um, depending on travel and if I'm awake, alive, uh, coherent. And as you could hear from the beginning of this show, I was not very coherent today, so I'm afraid of what Thursday is. None of us are. Yeah, I'm far less coherent than the rest of you guys. I'm telling you, I got some kind of whiplash motion sickness from trying to call that game last night. It was difficult. But anyway. DC shakes, brother. Yeah, (laughs) something. Anyway, that's it for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, everybody, for tweeting at us. It was a lot of fun. Thanks to Jessica from Unrelegated for jumping in as well. We'll be uh, back tomorrow, and we'll be back with soccer over there next Monday. Uh, Mucha plata, all the lira, all the all the cash you can find. Have at it. Euros. So, there you go. And uh, make make sure that you continue to see that Leeds United is in the automatic promotion zone in the championship. Peace. Hey.